All right, I guess let's get started. Um, so hello everyone, uh, welcome to the fifth Spectrum Professional Development Lunch Talk of this semester. Uh, this week, we have a special guest speaker, Dr. Karen Lee, who's going to be talking about the uh, Oscar program and in general, um, how to present uh, topics. So uh, welcome everyone and thank you for coming. And if you have any questions during the talk, don't uh, don't hesitate to ask or put it in the chat or use our anonymous question forum. And without further ado, uh, I'll bring it over to Dr. Lee to get started. Thank you. Um, I had planned today to talk about like conferences and presentations. If people want information about Oscar, I can also do that. So I thought I'd start out with talking about like conference tips and then see how much of like the presentation stuff people want, wanted me to do, how much detail. Um, but I can also talk about Oscar if that's um, what people are looking for. Either way. I'm sorry about that. I think I was confusing it a little bit with our talk last week. Um, so sorry for any confusion there. Oh, that's okay. No worries. Um, so let me go ahead and share my PowerPoint. Can you see the PowerPoint? Yep, looks good. Great. Okay, so um, I thought I'd start out with conferences and what a conference is like and some tips or tricks about how to um, navigate a conference successfully. And then I'll go back and talk about types of presentations. And you can give me you know, your, your feedback on how much of that you want. Um, but, but my understanding was that people were curious, you know, what is a conference like? What do you do at a conference? How do they work? So um, these days, when we talk about conferences, we really have to talk about two different kinds of conferences, the traditional face to face conference, which is coming back, but coming back slowly and virtual conferences. And they really are really very different kinds of events um, just by their nature and not just because one's on screen and one's face to face, but because those uh, modalities bring with them a lot of differences in behavior and how you network with people, and even where you are when you're um, uh, attending the conference. And so I thought I'd first talk a little bit about face-to-face -face conferences. And so if you go to a conference where you're actually going to a place and people are converging on a location to have this conference or meeting, um, th these are um, I, actually my favorite way to do conferences is a face-to-face -face conference. But generally people will come to um, a location off, sometimes it's a hotel, sometimes it is a college campus, sometimes it's a convention center, it depends on the conference, often on the size of the conference. And um, there will be a variety of events at the conference. There will be uh, some sort of a welcome social, there will lots be lots of other um, uh, social events and network events. There will be usually be talks, um, talk sessions or oral presentation sessions. There will be poster sessions if this is a STEM conference. Um, and uh, then there will often be other things. So sometimes professional development workshops, sometimes um, job placements, sometimes an exhibitors area where um, uh, biological supply companies and book publishers and um, uh, uh, national associations will be at the, at the um, at the exhibitors uh, area, um, and sometimes even a graduate school um, uh, fair, depending on what the conference is. Um, and the idea of this is for people to come together and for this to be their sole focus. And so you're in, in this hotel or several hotels in, in, a, in a city um, over three or four days, there are things planned basically from when you get up in the morning off until when you go to bed at night. Um, and so that you're all meeting each other. The idea is not only to see the talks and to go to the posters and learn a bunch of cool things, but to have networking. And so when you go to a face-to-face -face conference, there's a number of things that you want to think about um, when you're going to the conference. Um, first, if I can get this to work, is that to plan each of your day's attendance. If there's a group of you going, you can split it up. So if there are, you know, three sessions, three um, talks that 
you all want to go to at the same time, send one person to each of the talks. If you're alone at the conference, you sit down with either a hard copy um, conference program, but more often now there are either conference apps that you download to your cell phone, or it's a PDF, a searchable PDF that you download to your phone or your laptop. Um, and each day plan what you're going to go see. Look through the whole thing. Look at the whole week, decide which things you're going to go to. Um, and you want to do that ahead of time. So one, you can plan where you need to be, um, but also so that you don't find yourself, um, say, during a coffee break, tr frantically trying to figure out where you're going to go next. One of the reasons you want to do this is if this is a big conference, you may often have, if it's a, on a university campus, a college campus, you may have a, a meeting at 10 o'clock, a talk at 10 o'clock in one building and a talk at 1020 in another building. And you really have to think about whether you can make it between the two talk, the two, two events. Do you want to plan? Um, oops, sorry, my, there we go. Find out what the dress and other conventions for the event are. Um, and what I mean is, um, sometimes these events are relatively informal. I'm a marine biologist and most marine biology conferences are not even necessarily business casual. Um, uh, I've been to several marine biology conferences where a Hawaiian shirt and a, and a pair of pants and um, keens are just fine for giving a presentation. I have a friend who's a, histor a military historian and you would never show up in a Hawaiian shirt and, and you know, um, chinos and uh, keens at one of her conferences because half the presenters are in uniform. And so she dresses up when she presents. She's in a, a business suit, sometimes pants, often a skirt and heels. Um, and the men um, are in uh, either, uh, if they're military, they're in uniform, so are the women, um, or they are in, uh, something that is obviously business attire, a tie um, and a, a shirt and often a jacket. So you want to find out what the convention is. Most conferences now are business casual or just north of that. But find out. Find out if they have, what kind of meet and greets they have, whether you have to buy as you're registering for the conference, do you have to pay for some of these meet and greets? Is it worth paying for them? Do you have to buy tickets to buy to get alcohol, for example, if you want alcohol? Do you have to pay for the food? And find out how all that works before you get there. And it's not advancing. Give me a minute. It will advance eventually. Hello. Oh, yes. Now I got five. My apologies. Um, attend se sessions that interest you even if they're not directly related to your topic. Sometimes these conferences will be relatively broad and you can go to something that's not necessarily your topic, but sounds really interesting um, to go to. So for example, every year we take students to the National Conference on Undergraduate Research and NCUR is, um, covers all of the undergraduate research disciplines. So you can go to a vocal performance and a chemistry talk and a physics poster and a poetry reading all on the same day. Um, and so look at all the sessions and see what interests you. Go to the meals and breaks and the social events. Um, these are places where this is where you meet people. You're not gonna meet people in a talk. You might ask a question. If you can, you might meet up with that person later to ask a question, but sitting at lunch, where you just walk up to a table and say, hi, can I join you having coffee or a snack during the breaks? Everybody's in the lobby um, uh, having a break. And people are talking with each other. Often they'll come out of a talk, all come out together and chat. And if there are social events that are not really expensive, go to the social events. Because again, this is where you meet people. Introduce yourself to people, um, especially if you've seen and enjoyed their presentation. Go and find them at lunch. Look for them, ask them what, um, uh, what they do, network with them, because you will often find really great connections at these conferences. Um, I, uh, in 2011, was, which is the last time I was on sabbatical at where I used to work, I, um, in 2010, I was at the Benthic Ecology meetings in um, uh, North Carolina. And during a poster session, I saw a poster I was interested in, and I 
basically left my poster like 10 minutes early to go find the person I wanted to talk to. And we got chatting and I was telling him what I wanted to do next. And he told me about a fellowship program at the lab where he worked. I would never have found it by myself probably without knowing it was there. And I applied for the fellowship and spent a month in South Carolina for my sabbatical and they paid for my transportate for my, my mileage driving down. They bought me some supplies and they housed me for a month so I could do research at their lab. Um, if I had not been at the conference and just struck up a casual conversation with another crab biologist, I might never have found this out. Um, if you're looking for graduate programs, talk to people in the graduate program. Um, make sure that you do some networking. This is gonna seem counterintuitive after I just told you to attend the meals, the breaks and the social events, plan some free time. If this is a long conference, say four days, all day long, at some point you're going to find your interest flagging. <laughs> you're gonna have been at talks for hours a day and you're gonna have some lunch where you'll be like, I don't wanna go to any more talks. So sometimes what you wanna do is plan that in. What I often will do is I will look and see, okay, is there an afternoon where there isn't very much I really wanna see? hopefully later in the conference, and I will plan an afternoon to go see the area where we are, to go do a little touring, to maybe just read a book in my dorm room um, or my hotel room. I, I often stay in dorms at conferences or to just go for a walk on campus or around the neighborhood. And so plan some free time for yourself. Otherwise you get pretty burned out. I'm sorry, I'm not sure why this is not advancing. Zoom is something, oh yes, and now I'm too far. Sorry about that. There we go. Um, bring a business card with you to hand out. This is something I forget to do. I have business cards and you can get business cards made relatively inexpensively. And, and I bet 30% of the time I forget to bring my business cards to conferences. And people are like, do you have a business card? I'm like, I do in Fairfax. So make sure you bring a business card because you can hand it to people instead of trying to write down email addresses and where they are and they can hand you theirs and you can write on the back why you have this business card, who this person is and how you wanna follow up with them. Um, and follow up with people you have met. This is also something I'm not always great at. So I meet somebody, we have a great conversation and two weeks later, I'm like, who was that person I was talking to about frogs? And I can't remember who they are. Um, and so take people's cards, write down why you talk to them, what's interesting, or find them in the program and write notes in the program. And so, um, <coughs> excuse me, like I said, I really enjoy a face-to-face -face conference much more than a virtual conference, partly because I like to meet people. I enjoy sitting down at lunch with people I've never met before, walking up to a group and introducing myself and sitting with them um, and listening to what they're saying or, and, and um, you know, uh, uh, contributing if I can. Um, and it's hard to do that on virtual conferences. The good thing about virtual conferences is that that is how we have kept conferences going during COVID when it was not safe to have a face-to-face -face conference. But also virtual conferences are way less expensive than face-to-face -face conferences. A face-to-face -face conference can cost upwards of seven or $800 to attend or more. I have paid as much as $1,300 or my office has to attend a face-to-face -face conference because you have to get there, you have to stay, you have to pay registration, you have to buy meals. Virtual conferences are cheap. You pay registration, and then you sit in your dorm room or your living room or your office and attend a conference. Let's see if I can go to the next slide without having an issue. There we go. So let's talk a little bit about virtual conferences. Um, they, I've been to a lot of virtual conferences in the last two years. Um, and there are, as I said, there are some advantages to virtual conferences is that you don't have to leave. Um, and so they're much less expensive to attend um, and you can keep going to them even when um, we're having a pandemic um, or the weather is terrible or, you know, any number of reasons why you can attend a virtual conference and not be able to attend face to face. Um, but there are some things that are different about virtual conferences than face to face. Obviously, they're virtual. 
but also some things that you want to keep in mind to get the most out of your virtual uh, virtual conference if you're attending. First, whatever tool or platform they're using for the conference, practice using it ahead of time. Make sure your internet connection is going to work. Make sure you can download and use this platform on the computer you're planning to use. And if they offer a um, practice or information sessions ahead of time, go. Because one of the things I saw many times at conferences, and it happened to me, is that you will get on and your internet will kick you off. Like you get kicked out of a Zoom thing. When I was um, uh, 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 moderating NCUR virtually in the spring, I came back to my office in the Johnson Center, even though there was no one else here. I was in my office all by myself, literally all by myself for weeks. Um, because I didn't trust my home internet connection and I didn't want to be in a Zoom room with undergraduate students and then disappear from the room. So I came in and used my Ethernet connection in the JC, which is a much was a much more stable connection than my Cox broadband at home. Secondly, the same as for a face-to-face -face event, find out the dress and the conventions for the event. The good news is you only have to worry about your dress from the waist up because no one's going to see what you're wearing. Um, but I also found that for thing for many Zoom things and for a Zoom conference, I like to dress the part even if no one can see what I'm wearing. Block off the time as if you were away from home. This is one of the things that I didn't think about a lot the first couple of times I went to a virtual conference and that we didn't talk to students about it in Kerr. And I think a lot of people didn't talk to them about. And so what happened is often people treat virtual conferences as if they're at work still. And so they'll be on their work email. They will um, only go to um, uh, the part of the conference where they don't have a meeting at work. Instead of saying, hey, I'm at a conference this week, I won't be in class. I won't be at this meeting, I'm at a conference. Because you're thinking, well, I'm not at a conference, I'm in my dorm room, I'm in my bedroom, I can go to class. Well, if you go to class, then you miss part of the conference. Um, you don't get to see something you wanna see. And so this year for NCUR, we're going to talk to students about blocking this off as if they were in Georgia at NCUR. The last time we took students to NCUR face-to-face, -face, we were in suburban Atlanta. And so students actually left got in a bus and went to suburban Atlanta. Um, the time before that, we took people to Oklahoma. Um, the next NCUR in 2023 is going to be in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And so you're actually away. That's one of the advantages of a face-to-face -face conference is you're not at home. You can't, you're not going to do your laundry. You're not going to go to class. You're not going to have a bunch of meetings. You're going to, I, I turn off my email when I'm at a conference and maybe check it at night before I go to bed. Um, and so make sure you block at least some of the time off as if you were actually away from home. Again, review the agenda and plan each day. If there's a group of you, split it up just as if you were at a face-to-face -face conference. One of the suggestions I've seen on the internet, and the more I thought about it, the more I liked it, is take your notes on paper. If you were at a conference, you might have your laptop out at a face-to-face -face conference and be taking notes on your laptop. But if you're at a virtual conference, you're already doing so much on screen, give your brain a break and write your notes on paper. Have a piece of paper next to you and write your notes. Then you're not um, going back and forth between windows and you give your, your brain and your body a break from doing everything on screen. As you all know by now, concentrating on a talk on Zoom is way different from sitting in class or sitting in a room and listening to somebody talk. Make sure you take breaks. In face-to-face -face conferences, they're built in. So you go to maybe an hour, then maybe an hour um, of talks, and then there's a 15-minute coffee break, and then an hour and a half of talks and lunch. And then two-hour poster session and a coffee break and a plenary session and dinner. They're not expecting you to be right at doing conference things 24, you know, not 24, but 16 hours a day without taking any breaks at all. We tend to sit, if we're on Zoom, I know I do, I don't get up and leave. I don't walk around. 
I stay on Zoom or in the break, I check my email. Make sure you take breaks. They're not built into the conferences, the virtual conferences often like they are in the um, face-to-face -face conferences, or you're also tempted if there's a break now, rather than going, getting up and going and getting a cup of coffee or a soda out of the fridge or whatever, you're tempted to check your email or work on, or work on something you need to work on. Actually take the break. This is something I struggled with in virtual conferences. Take advantage of networking opportunities. It is much harder to network at a virtual conference. And so most virtual conferences set up deliberate networking opportunities where they have rooms where you can go and visit drop-in rooms, or they have a virtual cocktail hour, or they have a virtual, uh, or they have a panel discussion where they will put people in break in breakout rooms so that you can meet other people that are there. So take advantage of these. It is tempting to be like, you know what? I don't need to go to another one of these, but it's one of the things you miss at a virtual conference. And one of the reasons you go to conferences is to make these kinds of connections. And so take advantage of it when they offer them. Do you have questions about conferences and what to do at a conference and how to navigate a conference before I talk about presentations a little bit? I did have a quick question actually um, sure. about the point you mentioned on face-to-face -face conferences about bringing business cards. Mm -hmm. um, personally, I don't know if this is just me, but as an undergraduate, I don't know, it, it, I would feel like kind of pretentious if I had business cards to give to people. I, I don't know if that's just me, but it, it, how do you feel about that? I, I can see that you might feel that way. Um, and I think if, I think it's okay to have a business card with you. And if someone asks you, you can hand it to, it to them. I don't generally give my business card. I don't even give my business cards out unless someone asks. But I often will ask, do you have a card by any chance? Even to students, I'll ask. And so have a few made up. And if they, you don't use them, you don't use them. Um, it, but it's, it's, I think, especially as you're going to conferences where you're going maybe to, uh, there are job interviews at the conference or you're going to meet somebody in particular, you might want to have something like that. Um, and if you feel uncomfortable using them, don't, and that's okay. But if somebody asks you, um, I hate it when someone asks me and I'm like, no, I forgot. Um, and then you can say, oh, actually I do have a card and you can hand it to them. So that's a, actually a really good question. Um, I did not have a business card when I was a graduate student. Um, I started carrying a business card when the university I worked for started to provide them for me. But there's now, you know, all over the internet, I think even templates in, in like Canva and things like that, where you can make a quick and easy business card. Okay, thank you. Sure. Anybody else have a question before I talk a little bit about presentations? Okay, um, let me talk about presentations. So when we talk about presentations, there are lots of ways that you can share your work. And I use the word presentation in the broad sense. A lot of people, when they think presentation, they think talk. And then when they say, I say presentation, they say, I thought we were doing a poster, but I'm talking now about presentations in a very broad sense. Any way you share your work with people, I consider a presentation. And so, Four broad categories of presentations, talks, which are sometimes still called oral presentations, posters, where you stand in front of a board or sometimes a TV with a graphic of your work on it, either three, three minute theses, whoops, hey, three minute theses or elevated speeches. These are very short, um, light, sometimes um, conferences will do lightning talks. So three minute theses are three minutes. <laughs> Elevated speeches, usually one to two, and lightning talks often five minutes, so they're relatively short. Um, talks at conferences are generally 10 or 15 minutes. Um, if you're invited to give a longer presentation, I've given 30-minute presentations I've been invited to give. Um, I've been on panel discussions, which were 40 minutes or 90 minutes, and so it just depends on the kind of oral presentation. Posters are literally um, something you print out and put on a board and stand in front of while you talk. Um, most of the time you do not need to bring your own board, but always check. Um, and uh, uh, I personally like posters. I give a lot of poster presentations because they're more social and I like to talk to people's faces. Um, 
I do not love virtual poster sessions, though I have done several of those as well. Um, and then also you could do an article, you could write an article or give a paper, um, either, either write a paper or actually give a paper. In one second, I just got a message. Okay, that's fine. And so, an, so an overview about presentations and kinds of presentations. Um, some things to keep in mind, no matter how you're giving a presentation or where you're giving it. First of all, your audience. Who are you talking to? Um, you can give presentations on the same material to wildly different audiences. So um, I work on color changing green crabs and I gave a poster at um, <laughs> something called the International Crustacean Congress in DC uh, three years ago. It's an international meeting. Everybody at the meeting works on crustaceans, which are crabs, lobsters, shrimp, crayfish, isopods. Um, and I gave a poster at that, and I had to explain very little about my organism. I said what it was, what I was interested in. I didn't have to define terms because anybody at that meeting knows enough about crabs to understand the jargon. I gave a talk on the same information at Westminster College several years ago in Pennsylvania and was told that I was going to give a presentation to the biology department and that most of the students in the room would be an introductory biology. They'd be first year students. And I thought, OK, I not only have to talk about why my particular crab is important, but I have to talk about what a crab is and what the body parts are. and. Um, why, why we care to study them at all and how they grow and things I didn't have to talk about at the crustacean meetings. And so you want to keep your audience in mind. The purpose, why are you giving this presentation? If you're at a conference, it's to let people know what you're doing and make connections. If you were giving a presentation um, uh, for a job talk, like um, a faculty members, when they apply for jobs, almost always have to give a presentation. That's a really different presentation on your research than a presentation you give at a conference. Maybe you're giving a presentation um, uh, for an interview for a fellowship. Maybe you're giving a presentation to a community group who wants to know what kind of work is being done at, um, at the university you work at. Um, I used to love to go in to elementary schools and talk about lobsters. I would literally bring in a cooler with two lobsters inside and spend a half an hour introducing students, uh, fourth graders to lobsters. That's a totally different kind of talk than I gave about lobsters to the, in the community seminar series or I gave at the American Society of Zoologists meeting. And so think about the purpose. It's often tied into your audience. The content. What do you need to include? Again, that's um, also tied into your purpose, but how much detail do you need? What do you need to include so people can understand your presentation? What are the guidelines for the presentation? This includes how long it is, what kind of presentation it is. Are you using PowerPoint? Do you have to upload the PowerPoint ahead of time? Does it need to be PowerPoint as a PDF? Um, do you need to bring a flash drive? Um, do you have to, uh, what's the deadline for the abstract? How long is the talk? Anytime you're gonna give a presentation at a conference, there will be guidelines. So if you give me a poster presentation, they're gonna tell you how big the poster board is and its orientation. I once went to a, 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 a an ecology meeting and twice, and I got two different measurements for the poster boards, and I thought, huh. And instead of emailing them and asking, I guessed. So did every a lot of other people, because about uh, half of us showed up with vertically oriented posters, and about half of us showed up with horizontally oriented posters. And the boards were hor the boards were horizontal, and they were mounted on the wall, so you couldn't flip them. And and so those of us who had our posters the wrong way all had a good laugh because our posters were hanging off the ends of the board, like up on the wall with tape, and there was all this extra board on the sides. And so make sure you understand the guidelines. I can tell you all kinds of stories where I have made mistakes like that. The style of your discipline is gonna be different. You all are 
uh, physics and astronomy. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So you're going to do this in whatever the discipline style is of physics and astronomy, whatever the citation style format is, um, and however you talk about things in the style. But imagine if you were giving a talk in history or a, doing a poster in history, it would be a very different style. And you want to talk to your mentor about that. And so you want to keep all of these things in mind. Let me talk briefly about poster presentations. There are advantages to doing poster presentations and challenges to doing poster presentations. What do you think? I'll ask you for some, some, some uh, uh, um, um, sorry, my brain went dead. Some, uh, what you think some of the advantages are instead of you listening to me talk, what do you think some of the advantages are to giving a poster presentation instead of a talk? Well, yeah, uh, one thing you already mentioned uh, was that it's more conversational with the audience. You get more interaction that way. Much more, yes, it's much more conversational. You can spend 20 minutes with one person if you want to. Um, what else might be an advantage of a post presentation? I'm happy to put them up myself. <laughs> I mean, you could have a lot of figures of all your work all presented all at once and show the general picture. Yep, it's often easier to tell the story because it's all there, right? Um, and so advantages, compared to oral presentations, it is often less formal. You're chatting with people, you're talking about your work, you can point at the poster, they can ask, ask questions, more interactive, and for some students, less intimidating than standing in front of a room full of people in front of your slides. Um, it's much less like public speaking. What um, several students I've talked to said the first couple of interactions at the poster were nerve wracking, but by the time they'd gone through their spiel three or four times and realized that they would be able to answer the questions people asked, they got much more comfortable. You get a chance to practice. Um, also, you get, an, uh, again, the opportunity to meet people that you're going to, um, uh, uh, who are interested in the same things you are colleagues maybe who maybe couldn't have gone to your talk maybe they can't even talk to you at your poster but they walk by your poster at lunch and send you an email later because they've seen your poster and they want to talk to you as you as you uh said um mike right um there is also the opportunity to lay things out so you can see the whole thing at once and also it's done before you leave Right? You have to do it ahead of time. It's all done before you go to the conference. The biggest challenges of posters. The first is, ah, cheapest, that there is skill required to prepare a good poster. Less is more. If you put a whole bunch of stuff up on a poster, it is going to be too hard to read. It's going to be tiny. People are going to find it intimidating. They're not going to be able to follow it. You have to think about what do I really need to put on here? It needs to be big enough to read. And you cannot make last minute changes. That's also an advantage, but it has to be done before you go because you got to print it out and take it with you. If you're working on a PowerPoint thing and you bring your laptop, you can literally work on the slides as you're walking into the meeting room. I don't recommend that. But you can't do that with a poster. That is both a, an advantage and a disadvantage. The disadvantage is if you make a typo, it's hard to fix. And I did once make a typo. I went to a conference. I had read the poster. I put the poster up and realized there was a big typo right in the middle of the poster. So I bought some white out. I whited it out. And I fixed it with pencil. And again, we all laughed. People were like, yeah, that happened to me last conference too. Um, but what you, you can, if you take the time, you can prepare a really nice poster that is graphically pleasing and that people find easy to navigate. Oh my goodness. <laughs> now half my slide is up. Come on, there we go. All right, how much time was I supposed to take? Like 40 minutes, yes? Yeah, that's... Okay. But so it, let, I'm sorry? Don't, don't rush if you, if you have a lot more to say. Well, what I can do is I can skip this kind of stuff and I can give you my slides if people want to look at this part. I can skip. 
to let me end the show for a second. Where do I want to skip to? Instead of going through all the parts like I'm a poster and parts of a data driven presentation and all of that, um, I can talk about design logistics. Because you all are going to be, if you're doing physics and astronomy, you all are going to be get doing um, uh, uh, data driven posters. And so I don't need to talk about the difference in posters. The things to keep in mind when you do posters. There we go. It should be crisp and clean. You want people to want to come up to your poster and look at it. The lettering should be legible from four feet away. Don't use really, really tiny font to fit stuff in. With two exceptions, I often use tiny font for my acknowledgments and my references, because those are the things people are least likely to read. Um, and aim for about 50-50 text and visual elements, graphs, pictures, and figures. So what that might mean is putting a picture of your apparatus up on your poster so you get more pictures. Because you do not want this to be wallow text. You want this to be pictures and text. Check the poster size. It varies wildly. It is not necessarily going to be the size of the templates on the Oscar website. And so make sure you check and that you, if you're using PowerPoint, for example, to make your poster, that you set the size correctly. Because what you don't want to do is get there and discover that your poster will not fit on your board on the board and there are uh, templates available with the mason logo and other things on it and they're at um in the poster section of the oscar website let me see what else can i talk about quickly um a quick thing about talks there are a number of ways to think about giving talks First, you can write the whole talk out beforehand. So you have a 15 minute talk and you literally write your talk as if it were a paper. Write it all out beforehand. And then with that talk that you've written out beforehand, you can do a number of things. You can read it in front of the audience. This is actually a very common way of presenting in some of the humanities and social sciences. My friend, the historian, always writes her paper out and reads it to the audience. That is. Un fairly unusual in STEM, but I have seen it done. You can memorize it. So you write the whole talk out beforehand and then you memorize it. Oops. Or you don't memorize it if you're comfortable, but you use prompts or notes. You can have note, like I used to have note cards. And then I graduated to when I was using, not PowerPoint, two by two slides, putting a text slide up with the question or the next point I wanted to make. Or like this, you have PowerPoint, you can see what's on your PowerPoint slide and that's your prompt. There are pros and cons to these methods. And so talk to me about what the, pro, what the con, a pro, for example, of memorizing a written talk and the con of memorizing a written talk. What's the pro? What's the, the advantage of memorizing a talk you wrote up beforehand? A pro is that it eases anxiety, at least for me it does. But sometimes if someone asks you like to go back to a different slide, then you kind of get out of order and you may lose your spot. That's correct, yes. So memorizing often makes people feel secure. They know what they wanna say. They know how they wanna say it. But yes, the out of order thing is a problem. What's the other issue with memorization? That's a con, a potential con. It can uh, make you sort of narrow minded and strict on what exactly you're going to talk about. And so it could make it harder to answer questions. It can do that. Absolutely. And the other thing is that you, if you don't have prompts, what if you lose your place? How do you find where you are again? Now, if you've got slide prompts, then that will help you get back in place. But if you lose your place, and the all you have is a memorized talk, that's, it's that much harder to get back in. The other um, way you can do this is to not write it out beforehand, but to plan the talk. Use prompts or notes or an outline and 
um, talk, talk about each of the points that's in your outline or in your prompts, which is basically what I'm doing now. Or you can even do it off the top of your head. I would not suggest off the top of your head at a conference. Um, now, if this is an elevator speech, off the top of your head. If it's a three-minute thesis, off the top of your head works. But for a 15-minute talk, you, that's not what you want to do. And again, pros and cons. Um, what, tell me what, what would be a, a, an advantage of not writing the whole talk out beforehand? Um, it's sort of the opposite of memorizing it, then you're more free to uh, diverge and talk about what you think of while you're presenting. Yes, yes, for sure. It um, allows you to uh, appear often more natural and also to add something you've thought about um, or um, go, go back to answer a question, um, all of those things. Um, the um, Con, of course, is that if you don't have good notes and you don't know the topic well enough, then you could find yourself a little bit lost. And let's see, was there anything else I wanted to talk about today? Um, yes, this again works with talks. One last slide and then I will try it. So when you're giving the actual talk, some things to keep in mind. Um, the organization of your talk should be, again, appropriate for your discipline. So in physics and astronomy, you generally do an introduction, uh, uh, materials and methods, uh, results, discussion, and conclusion. Try to keep out the jargon. Even if you're talking to physicists, using a lot of jargon um, it does not necessarily make the talk better. Um, and so if you can use less jargon, less discipline-specific terminology, then that often makes for a clearer talk. Use good visual aids. Be really careful with PowerPoint. Um, when I first, uh, uh, when they first started using PowerPoint, when I was going to conferences, um, people would put up these PowerPoint slides that you could not read. There was so much on the slide, you were like, what? And that divides your attention, right? The audience is listening to you talk, but there's this really elaborate PowerPoint slide behind you. So keep your PowerPoint slides simple or whatever you're using so that what's up there is what you're saying, what you're talking about. Um, keep the, the talk itself as simple as you can and speak clearly and slowly, especially if you talk fast when you're nervous. This is a, an issue that I have. I talk pretty fast anyway. Um, and when I'm teaching, I tend to write on the board to try to slow myself down some because otherwise it's hard. I'm sometimes hard to follow because I talk fast. I think, uh, and make eye contact. Even if you're reading off notes, Make sure that every once in a while you look up and engage with the audience. You have all been in rooms, in a talk or in a lecture or in a meeting where people aren't making eye contact. This is what happens on Zoom all the time, right? I'm like, look at the camera. Um, uh, you don't, if the person does not make eye contact with you, it's much less engaging. And so you wanna to try to make eye contact. And I think that is where I'm gonna end. I will just show you my example of a bad PowerPoint. Oops, not that one. This one. I actually have been at talks like this, where the person is talking and up behind them is all this text on the PowerPoint slide. You cannot possibly listen to the person talking and read the PowerPoint. And so you're either going to miss what's on the PowerPoint or miss what the person is saying. So questions about anything. I, I obviously prepared much too much for 40 minutes. Um, but do people have questions about anything? I'm happy to answer, answer questions about Oscar. I'm happy to answer questions about conferences and about what conferences are like or about presentations. Um, I have a question about presenting. More so, I think it would be like presenting a PowerPoint, not really a poster. Um, I've seen this happen pretty often at business conferences and I haven't really seen anyone handle it too well. Um, sometimes there's like questions, not necessarily badgering, but like people 
like to interrupt and ask questions throughout the entire presentation. And I've seen people try to make a statement at the beginning and say, oh, we'll have time for questions at the end, but like that just isn't <laughs> observed. So I don't know if you have any advice or tips on how to try to get people to hold questions till the end without making them feel like they can't speak. Yeah, um, yeah, it, that's interesting because it must be disciplinary because I, I, every, anytime I've given a talk at a conference, the moderator says at the beginning, please hold your questions to the end. And I just keep talking. Um, yeah, if somebody interrupts, um, if this is conventionally what happens at the conference, your best bet is either to say, I'm going to get to that in the next slide or I quickly answer the question. If nobody is, if nobody is enforcing the please wait till the end, um, you don't want, you're right, you don't want to make people feel like they can't ask questions, but you also don't want your presentation to get derailed because people keep interrupting you. And so I think if they ask a question and it's in your, you know, two slides away, just say, oh, I'm going to get to that in just a bit. Could you hold your question till I get there? And then talk about the thing and then answer the question. Uh, if that, does that make sense? Okay, yeah, no, that's, that's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Other questions? <laughs> All right. Um, if no one, if no one has any other questions for Dr. Lee, um, uh, Spectrum Leadership wanted to also do a very quick um, presentation on physics and astronomy presentations specifically, or conferences rather, um, and how all of what she's talked about today relates to her discipline specifically. So I'm going to share a quick PowerPoint on that, and, and we'll. We'll I will that. exit, and if you want the PowerPoint slides, um, I can send yeah. them. Yes, uh, if you don't mind, that would be Thank you. Sure. And thank you, uh, Dr. Lee, for the great talk today. Um, That's very insightful and helpful. So thank you for doing that. I'm glad, and thank you for the invitation. Have a good night. You too. OK, and so let's talk about physics and astronomy uh, conferences specifically. So uh, the first one that we wanted to talk about here is the GMU College of Science Colloquium that is held every, I think it's every year. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, but this is a colloquium presentation for all the College of Science, um, not just physics and astronomy, uh, and it's basically you get to make a poster and present an abstract and all of your methods and research and results and present it to the whole College of Science and uh, all of your fellow students. Um, so yeah, there's, there's topics on biology, chemistry, geology, anatomy, and physics, of course, and the professors of the College of Science will go around and look at your posters and interact with you just like any other poster presentation. Uh, and it gives you a chance to just interact with the uh, other colleges outside of physics and astronomy and share what you've been doing with your fellow students. Um, so it's, it's a low stress sort of presentation environment. Your audience is not going to know specifically about your field, really, unless you're talking to other physics students. So you can be more uh, relaxed in that regard. And there's also last year they did like a, an awards ceremony where they um, gave awards to the best abstract and the best poster in each discipline. And there were gift cards that went along with that, I believe. Um, and also Virtually last year, they held it on Gather Town, um, and so that was fun. I don't know if it's going to be back in person this year or not, but I, I guess we will find out. And then uh, for more, uh, inter more bigger conferences, there's the American Astronomical Society. They have meetings every uh, two every year, one in January and then one in June. So they've been meeting since 1899, if you can believe it. Um, this year is going to be the 239th conference. 
and that's going to be in January in Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, if anyone is thinking about actually going, the deadline for abstracts is uh, tomorrow, actually, um, <laughs> just, just so you're aware. Um, but it's a general ast astronomy and astrophysics conference um, that's meant to cover all kinds of subtopics in the field. And so it's more specific than the GMU colloquium because it's not all science, it's just astronomy and astrophysics, um, but it's not necessarily specific to whatever you research you're doing in astronomy and astrophysics. Um, and so every year they have uh, plenary sessions, which are the bigger 20 to 30 minute talks from people in select subfields that are invited to give those talks. And then they also have uh, regular like shorter 10 to 15 minute talks and also subdivision meetings like the division of planetary science um, and the higher energy astrophysics division. Uh, but the, the posters at the American Astronomical Society meetings are interesting and I wanted to highlight them a bit because they're uh, actually not physical posters. They are electronic, what they call eye posters. And so it's the uh, AAS's pr proprietary poster format, basically, and they're interactive. So instead of having like a poster board in the convention hall, you will have a digital screen where your poster is being displayed and people can come and uh, like interact with it and open up the different subsections of your poster and look at all the different figures that you have. So you're less limited in the space that you have on your poster because you can uh, open up all of the subsections basically uh, of your poster and put all the text that you want without making it a really small font. Um, that being said, uh, you still don't want to put too many, too much text so that your poster gets so long that nobody can finish it. Um, but you have a little bit um, more leeway there. Um, so that's the AAS meetings. And I will turn it over to talk about the AGU meetings. Yeah, so as a more kind of like astronomy, planetary science, earth science conference, there's the American Geophysical Union that has meetings yearly in December. Uh, the next meeting will be held this December, uh, December 13th to 17th in New Orleans. It's a similar format to AAS. It's got like plenary speakers, invited speakers, um, poster sessions, science sessions where you can go listen to talks, um, town halls to just like discuss different topics. Um, so yeah, this is a really great opportunity for anyone who's involved in those fields. Another broader um, conference with like a lot of different topics is the American Physical Society meetings uh, for just anyone who's in astronomy and physics, any topic in astronomy and physics. Um, the APS March meeting is a little bit uh, more focused in on what topics it covers. It's held every March um, in a different location each year. Um, this year in 2022, it's gonna be held in Chicago. Uh, the APS April meeting is a little bit different than the March meeting. It's a little bit broader. Um, there's a lot more topics covered. Pretty much anyone from astronomy and physics can come present at that one. Um, this year it's going to be held in New York City. Um, and the third APS conference that is really great is uh, the Conference for Undergraduate Women in Physics. It's held every winter, uh, usually in January, and the location depends on your region. So depending where you're from in the United States, um, that d dictates what location you go to because these conferences are held in a lot of different locations every year. Um, there's upwards of 10 locations every year. There's a lot. Um, but those are specifically to help undergraduate women and gender minorities network and gain professional development skills. Um, all of these are similar to the aforementioned conferences um, with the speakers, the poster sessions. Um, you can give a talk, you can give a poster at any of these. Um, so yeah, these are really great opportunities for physicists as well. Yeah, and uh, going sort of down the line specificness with these, um, presentations. First, the GMU colloquia was all of science, then the APS and the AAS are physics and astronomy specifically. But now you also will have conferences on specific subtopics in those fields. And an example of that uh, is test science conferences, which our last one was held in August of 2021, which was the second one. And these conferences are specifically concerned about the transiting exoplanet survey satellite or TESS and um, exoplanet related astronomy and astrophysics uh, about exoplanet candidates that were found with the TESS satellite and follow-ups 
observations on those test candidates and just exoplanet science in general, basically. Uh, so that's an example of a specific subtopic that has a conference dedicated to it in astronomy and astrophysics. And then there are also international conferences, um, which are held all, all around the world. All the conferences we've mentioned so far are just in America. Um, so if you want to travel around the world, you can look for international conferences. We have a link here um, where you can look for those. And then a few specific ones uh, are the International Astron Astronomical Union or the IAU and the Committee on Space Research, or COSPAR. Um, and th those are links there to their websites as well. So one, one question that we haven't really talked about so far is how do you get funding to go to these meetings? Because like Dr. Lee mentioned, it can be really expen expensive, upwards of hundreds to thousands of dollars for all the travel expenses and food and living expenses for where you want to go and present. So it can be a lot to pay for, and you're definitely not going to want to pay for that out of pocket if you can avoid it. So things you can, ways you can fund this are through uh, your advisor's grants, which sometimes, but not always, your advisor will have specific grant money set aside for this very purpose. Uh, so you can ask them about that. But if they don't, there are a few other options, such as the undergraduate student travel fund or the USTF, uh, you can apply to this, well, you have to apply at least 30 days before you travel. And there are maximum amounts that you can get awarded for this, 400 for local travel, 600 for domestic or 800 for international travel. Um, and then there's a graduate student travel fund, which as the name suggests is only applicable if you're a grad student. And uh, these can be up to $500, depending on the location and the type of presentation. But international uh, travel can go up to $1. Uh, and then some conferences um, in the societies that hold those conferences also offer financial aid for go their conferences themselves, such as uh, fee waivers for the registration fee or allowing you to do volunteer work at the presentation such as judging posts or something like that, or, or cleanup or something that they will allow you to do in exchange for um, getting funding to go to these places. So you can always check the websites for, the, for those, uh, for the AAS and the APS and any other conferences that you are thinking about going to to see if those options are available. And that's pretty much it. So. Does anyone have any questions on any of these astronomy and physics specific conferences? And does anyone have anything to add as well that I might have glossed over or missed? Um, just a quick side note about the Graduate Student Travel Fund. I believe that they're like you can only receive it once a semester. Um, so if you're going to multiple conferences, I would suggest to like submit the most expensive one. And that one, I don't know about the other compensations from Mason, but that one is based on reimbursement. So you would have to pay for the fees up front. And that's something to consider because sometimes they can be kind of expensive and you might have to wait about a month or so to get the the reimbursement so that's just like for planning ahead as a side note all right great well if no one has any more questions then i guess we'll leave it there for today uh thank you everyone for coming and uh thank you all for being a good audience and asking questions and the recording will be posted to our YouTube channel as soon as it's ready. So thank you for coming and you guys have a good day.